buses like when a school bus crashes. Video that will make any parent cringe, along with the knowledge most of those buses don't have seatbelts. Regulators say they're safe, but could they be safer? Here's ABC's Paula Ferris. <laughs> Incidents like these unfold in just a fraction of a second. Everybody all right? But the images of mangled buses and shell-shocked students <gasps> linger long after school bus crash sites have been cleared. Which is why we're here to watch nine tons of steel smash to a standstill. With high-speed cameras, this team of engineers is able to freeze time to analyze in remarkable detail what happens when a school bus crashes to the vehicle and its precious passengers, who more often than not aren't wearing seatbelts. We can do better when it comes to safety. That's how we learn is actually crashing buses and evaluating, studying the films. Um, but we're going to find that we can do better than what is offered today. The results of this crash test in a moment. But first, the debate. Because for years, parents and safety advocates have questioned why most school buses are not equipped with seatbelts. It might seem like an obvious question, but according to government officials, it's not that simple. This is where it's always challenging because you're taking a system that's already safe and then you're saying make it safer. But what you don't want to do is have any unintended consequences. Nearly 24 million students commute on school buses every day. Every year, a few thousand are injured and an average of five are killed in crashes. 911, where's your emergency? Yes, the school bus just ran into the underpass at Emerson and uh, English Avenue. But when tragedy strikes, like on this morning in Indianapolis. Was there any kids on the bus? Yes, yes. I believe my daughter will still be here. If she had on a seatbelt. Her five-year-old daughter, Donesty, was on her way to school. <laughs> it's like it's fresh every day. When her bus slammed head on into a bridge. I didn't think that if I sent her with her daddy to get on a bus, she'd never come back. Michael Watkins was on the same bus that morning. I remember every time she was on the bus, she had candy. She always shared with everybody. But he doesn't remember the accident. He fell asleep on the way to school. I woke up. Then I just heard a lot of sirens and screaming. And then I just felt somebody touching me. And it hurt. His leg, his femur, broken. Do you think that he would have suffered the extent of those injuries had he been wearing a seatbelt? All I know is he wasn't in one, and he ended up with a broken femur, two surgeries, a wheelchair, walker therapy. U.S. regulations only require seatbelts on school buses under 10,000 pounds, and only six states require all school buses to be equipped with seatbelts. A big difference from many click-it or ticket laws across the nation that require us to belt up in cars. When you get in your mom's car, what's the first thing you do? I put on my seatbelt. But you don't have to wear a seatbelt on a school bus. Does it make sense to you? No. If you don't wear a seatbelt in the car, you got to wear it in the, on the bus, too. But there's not one on the bus. That's because school buses have been specifically designed to protect children without the use of seatbelts. We're talking about engineering concepts and physics concepts. The National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, does not make policy. But Chris Poland is part of their team that investigates serious school bus crashes and makes safety recommendations. We're talking about the science of the school bus, and I don't think that's well portrayed to the average mom and dad. We have a school bus that works extremely well, large, heavy vehicle, Bright colors, lights. We have compartmentalization, which protects occupants in the most frequent crash, which is frontal crashes. Compartmentalization refers to the high back seats that are like a protective envelope, absorbing energy during a crash. These design features are one of the reasons federal regulations do not require seatbelts on larger school buses. The vehicle itself has been designed for safety, yet when you look inside, we think lap and shoulder belts can add and reduce injuries and fatalities. Amy, one of the leading school bus seatbelt providers, invited ABC News for a first-hand look at how they think they can improve school buses. Larry Gray is Emmy's CEO and top engineer. So we're kind of getting a preview of the point of view from the cameras that are on board. Inside, inside the bus, yes. Yeah. So what you see, these will be high-speed videos, again, about a 1,000 frames per second. We have dummies that have a lot of instrumentation in them. So the dummies aren't so dumb. They're, They're so going to be telling us a lot. They're going to be telling us a lot. On the bus, 12 school-age dummies in various positions. Only four are belted. We have 20 different cameras rigged up. This bus right here is going to crash into that wall 30 miles an hour. I'm a little nervous. Three, two, one. <laughs> So let's see the extent of the damage. This kid that was leaning over, look at what he did to the seat. He bent the seat in half. When the occupant hits the back, um, it does deform and absorb energy. That seat back doing what it's designed to do. But when they're out of their compartment or they're not properly faced, they're going to come out of their compartment. Using an industry measurement called injury criteria, Emmy <laughs> says the crash has dummies without restraints fare much worse than the ones belted in. Lab and shore belts reduce injury by 50%. Not just frontals, but all forms of accidents. 50%? That's a statistic that NHTSA has. If you're in a side impact and you're restrained, that's going to be better than being unrestrained and just thrown. And Emmy says this is especially apparent in more uncommon accidents like side impacts and rollovers. This is very dramatic. They're thrown throughout the vehicle and they hit hard surfaces or the roof of the vehicle. Seatbelt saved lives. We wanted to see what NHTSA, the government agency responsible for school bus safety regulations, had to say about this new data. For years, their position, spelled out plainly on their website, has been school buses are one of the safest forms of transportation without seatbelts and have raised concerns that higher costs of buses with seatbelts could result in fewer buses and more students commuting in passenger cars where they are 20 times more likely to die in an accident. But when I went to see them, suddenly, a different story. Do you believe school buses would be safer 
with safety belts. Our job is to help save lives and prevent injuries. And our kids are precious. Every single day they go to and from school, we want them to be safe. And we know seatbelts save lives. If seatbelts save lives, why isn't there a federal mandate? Everything's on the table for us to look at. Just weeks into his new role as NHTSA's top dog, Mark Rosekind is now promising a full review. Is this an about face for your agency? I'm the new guy, fresh eyes. Does that mean we might change things? We may. And again, it's not just about the word, it's actions. We're going to look for every action we could take to help those kids be safer. It remains to be seen whether this review will lead to new regulations. If it does, it could also provide a small measure of purpose to a grieving mother like Danielle. My baby was a sacrifice. That would be her legacy. For Nightline, I'm Paula Ferris in Indianapolis. Okay, guys. The, let's talk about the buses on the ramps. If the speed limit is about 45 miles per hour or 35 miles per hour, do, how many of you guys notice that they don't really exceed the speed limit? Why? Does anybody know why? Because I remember back when I was working in Schaumburg, and Monday mornings usually, every single morning in general, once the schools are open, the traffic would significantly slow down because on the off ramps, I would notice that the traffic would slow down because of the buses. The buses would be all over the place. So if it's just 35 miles per hour, these guys go up to 35 miles per hour and they will not exceed the speed limit. What is it that they're afraid of? You know, you can negotiate a ramp at, this is 35 miles per hour. You should be able to negotiate it around 60 to 65 miles per hour, right? So this is video that will make any parent. This is something we discussed before. All right, so the maximum speed that the vehicle is gonna go off the curb, or the curb more like it, doesn't depend on the mass of the vehicle. So this is something that we've done before. So I'm just gonna take you through the derivation one more time. All right, so just, just jump through the derivation. You notice that maximum speed at which the vehicle is gonna skid off the ramp. It's gonna depend on the radius of the curvature. All right, so bigger, bigger the radius of curvature is this larger the speed is gonna be. On top of that, it's gonna depend on the quality of the tires that you have. That's it, those are the two factors. So the mass of the, mass of the bus doesn't matter. All right, so the only thing that matters is the quality of the tires, if you got the right quality, is the radius of curvature of the road. That's it. All right, so most vehicles are not gonna skid off the road before they reach about 60 to 65 miles per hour. And then what do they do? They end up banking the road, so it's about 70 miles per hour. So what is it that these people are afraid of? Okay, so Ayla, what's your point? All right, so guys, what's the, what's the point? <clears throat> Why is it that the school buses take their time when they're on off ramps and then on ramps? All right, so that's one of the things that I used to get real frustrated because if there's a school bus and all of a sudden the traffic slows down, I know I can negotiate that ramp at 60 miles per hour. I'm already going at 60 miles per hour, I hit the ramp. Just wanna keep at it at 60 miles per hour, except there's a bus usually, they slow down significantly. They slow down to about 35 miles per hour. The reason why they do that because they're afraid of rollovers, right? All right, so what do you think the rollover speed is when it comes to these buses? The common sense will say that they're prone to rollovers because they have a high center of mass. So the question is, would they skid off the roll first and then roll over after, or do you think they would roll, out, roll over first and then skid off the, skid off the ramp? All right, speaking of rollovers, let's watch this. This is, this is gonna be a fun little experiment. All right, so Lucia says they would roll over first. Most of you guys will say the same thing. So the question is, what is the rollover speed of these buses? Do you think it's very close to 35 miles per hour? Do you think it's 45? Do you think it's gonna be 55 miles per hour? Do you think it's gonna be 60? Do you think they would roll over first and then skid off the road? Or do you think they would skid off the road and then maybe roll over? And how do we how do we make that determination? All right, so what speed do you think the vehicles will roll over? What is the rollover speed of a vehicle on a ramp? What's up, guys? I'm in beautiful Dubai with my friend Mohammed and Rashid. And today I told my mom that I'm going to take her to a traditional dinner in the desert. Little does she know that she's going to have the best ride of her lifetime to this dinner. Sorry, mom. This guy, I don't know. You will find out. So get in this car because we're going to fly the drone and to make it look nice. Okay. So you get in this car and we'll follow you, okay? Are you not going to be with me? No, I'm coming with you. Okay. All right. Hey. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you guys? Hi. So what kind of food you prepare? A wrap? Traditional? Yeah. Do you like it? How much you like to buy? Today was like totally different from the lifetime. How much do you like to buy? Yeah. You love it? Hold tight, mom. Why? Yeah, he just likes to do speeding a little bit. And, you know, okay, like, please, and just don't speed. You know, like, I'm so okay. scared about speeding. No, 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 please don't speed. What? Are you freaking kidding me? Don't do this to me, please. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Oh no, why are you doing this to me? Like this? Oh no, it's crazy. Oh my god. Oh my god, you want to get me on 
to the bike. This is Arab lifestyle. Do you want to do it again? Hell no. Please, just start the car. I just want to get out. Do it again. Get, get out. No. Just <laughs> stop. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. No, no, no. Oh, my God. No. No. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You're kidding me. It's better than a roller coaster. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh my god! Oh my god! Guys, please stop! Welcome to the Middle East. This is the scariest thing ever. Please, just like, just please. We're just going back home. Oh my god! It's a lot of driving. He has a driver license. Everything's great. Just saying. Yeah, that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. Mom, 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 mom. What's up? What's up? We have, we have, we have. Sorry, sorry, I'm not sure. Mom, mom, mom. Are you serious? Mom. 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 Are you serious? Mom. Mom. Are you serious? Mom. Mom. Are you serious? Mom. Are you serious? Mom. 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 Mom. Are you Oh my god, that's the scariest shit ever, but they got you back. <laughs> oh, welcome. Please give this video a huge thumbs up for this driver. Subscribe, thank you guys so much for watching. Please from Middle East. Whenever you reach a rollover speed, right exactly at the rollover speed, notice that the car is going to rest on two side tires. So the question is, what is, how do you figure out the speed at which the vehicle is going to go in a rollover? On a ramp, so that's what we will Guys, I'm in beautiful Dubai with my friend. What does it depend on? Hey, it's me, that's the most. Spend an entire lecture talking about a falling cat. Welcome back to Smart Every. So one of the points that I was trying to make is the distance fallen does not matter in terms of how fast the cat can actually spin and land on four feet. All right, so the question is, how do cats manage to do that? Day. So you've probably observed that cats almost always land on their feet. Today's question is why? Like most simple questions, there's a very complex answer. For instance, let me reword this question. How does a cat go from feet up to feet down in a falling reference frame without violating the conservation of angular momentum? Now, I've studied free-falling bodies, my own in fact, in several different environments, and once I get my angular rotation started in one direction, I can't stop it. Today, we're going to use a high-speed camera. We're not going to use Allie because this is my daughter's cat. I don't want to hurt it. We're going to use a stunt cat. Let me introduce you to Gigi, the stunt cat. I'll just flip the uh, the video vertical and then motion track the cat, which is going to take a lot more effort than post. We're going to try to do it in a way that doesn't make anybody mad. That's pretty hard to do. You got to drop the cat. Ready, Gigi? Good. Checking out the high speed data there, Gigi. The thing it does when it's falling is try to figure out which way it's up. It does this either with the gyro in the ear or with its eyes. Ready to talk cat physics? All right, so check out this footage I captured with Phantom Mirror while Gigi goes to get a drink of water. So here's what's interesting about this to me. If you'll notice at the beginning of the drop, the cat is not rotating. Halfway through the drop, the cat is rotating, and then at the very end, Gigi somehow stops rotating. Newton's first law. So how did that happen? Hey, it's Fine. me, that's the welcome back. Having cleaned the stable of astronomy of circles and spirals, he said, he was left with only a single cartful of dung. He tried various oval-like curves, calculated the way, made some arithmetical mistakes, which caused him, in fact, to reject the correct answer. And months later, in some desperation, tried the formula for the first time for an ellipse. The ellipse matched the observations of Tycho beautifully. In such an orbit, the sun is not at the center, but is offset. It's at one focus of the ellipse. When a given planet is at the far point in its orbit from the sun, it goes more slowly. As it approaches the near point, it speeds up. Such motion is why we describe the planets as forever falling towards the sun, but never reaching it. Kepler's first law of planetary motion is simply this. A planet moves in an ellipse with the sun at one focus. As the planet moves along its orbit, it sweeps out in a given period of time an imaginary wedge-shaped area. When the planet is far from the sun, the area is long and thin. When the planet is close to the sun, the area is short and squat. Although the shapes of these wedges are different, Kepler found that their areas are exactly the same. This provided a precise mathematical description of how a planet changes its speed in relation to its distance from the sun. Now, for the first time, astronomers could predict exactly where a planet would be in accordance with a simple and invariable law. Kepler's second law 
is this. A planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Kepler's first two laws of planetary motion may seem a little remote and abstract. Uh, all right, planets move in ellipses and they sweep out equal areas in equal times. So what? It's not as easy to grasp as circular motion. We might have a tendency to dismiss it, to say it's a mere mathematical tinkering, something removed from everyday life. But these are the laws our planet itself obeys. As we, glued by gravity to the surface of the Earth, hurtle through space, we move in accord with laws of nature, which Kepler first discovered. When we send spacecraft to the planets, when we observe double stars, when we examine the motion of distant galaxies, we find that all over the universe, Kepler's laws are obeyed. Many years later, Kepler came upon his third and last law of planetary motion, a law which relates the motion of the various planets to each other, which lays out correctly the clockwork of the solar system. He discovered a simple mathematical relationship between the size of a planet's orbit and the average speed at which it travels around the sun. This confirmed his long-held belief that there must be a force in the sun that drives the planets, a force stronger for the inner fast-moving planets and weaker for the outer slow-moving planets. Isaac Newton later identified that force as gravity, answering at last the fundamental question, what makes the planets go? Kepler's third or harmonic law states that the squares of the periods of the planets, the time for them to make one orbit, are proportional to the cubes, the third power, of their average distances from the sun. So the further away a planet is from the sun, the slower it moves, but according to a precise mathematical law. Okay, speaking of the Kepler's laws. Like curves calculating some orbit, the sun is not at the center. I had the formula for the first time for an ellipse. The ellipse matched the observations of Tycho beautifully. In such an orbit, the sun is not at the center, but is offset. It's at one focus of the ellipse. When a given planet is at the far point in its orbit from the sun, it goes more slowly as it approaches. Notice that the closer the planet gets the near point, to the sun, the faster it's moving. It speeds up. And then the further away it goes. Such motion is because of the elliptical nature. Why we describe the it's slow enough. planets as forever fall. So as it starts to get closer towards the sun, it's moving faster, but never reaching it. Kepler's and then first law of planetary motion is simply this. It slows down. A planet moves. Okay, guys, the only force acting on the planets is the force of gravity. Force of gravity is always going to be acting on the planets at 90 degrees to the motion, which means that force of gravity is not going to transfer any any energy to the planets. In so, given the fact that no energy is being transferred to the planets in the form of kinetic energy, the sun at one focus. Why would the planet speed up? Is this getting closer to the? Is this getting closer to the sun, and then slows down when it starts to move further away? As the planet moves along its orbit, I mean, can we kind of talk about this? Okay, it's, it's, okay explain. Well, we, we said like uh, when uh, we have astronauts up in the space station, you know, if the space station were to come closer to the Earth, they'd have to move faster. Otherwise, it would fall into Earth's gravity and be pulled towards the planet instead of just maintaining that uh, orbit. So the plants speed up so that way they don't just fall into the sun. Okay, so the question is, how would they speed up given the fact that there's no work being done on the planets? Okay, guys, just give yourself five points. Give yourself 10 points. You're making a good point. Okay, so the amount of work that you do is the same as the amount of energy that you transfer, right? The amount of energy that you transfer will become the kinetic energy of the object. So the energy is going to be transferred in the form of motion. And then the work is done when there's a force that causes displacement. The force has to be an external force causing displacement, right? So um, is the force causing any sort of displacement, given the fact that the force is 90 degrees to the motion itself? So the answer to that question has to be no, I suppose. So how does the... So given the fact that there's no work being done, on these planets by the gravitational force. Why is it that these things are speeding up and slowing down? Is they start to come closer to the, I was gonna say the surface of the Earth. Is they're being, is they're moving closer to the sun, they speed up. They, as they start to move further away, they slow down. So the question is why? In the absence of an external force. Anyway, so we talked about torque. Okay, so I'm doing a fast review. Torque is the rotational force acting on mass. All right, so this is from the previous week. So you got the force acting on this mass. The mass is rigidly attached to this point, it's known as a pivot, so it's going to cause a rotational force. Rotational force is known as the torque. So the tangential force times the separation distance is going to give us the rotational force. The next question is, what if this rotational force is coming at an angle? Angle is going to be measured with respect to the R axis, radial axis. All right, so F parallel is the parallel component of this force. It's going to be parallel to the radial axis, and then this is the tangential component. And so tangential component, which means that it's going to be tangent to the curvature of the rotation. 
right? So the tangential component of this force, this is the force, this is the tangential component. Tangential component of this force is going to be responsible for the torque. So the tangential component is going to be opposite if you make a small triangle over hypotenuse. So this is the opposite side, this is the hypotenuse. So it's going to be sine of the angle. All right, so tangential force is going to cause a tangential acceleration. Tangential acceleration can be expressed in terms of the rotational acceleration. So we could do a back substitution into this formula. So you have MR times alpha. So you got R times R, so it's going to be MR squared. Okay, this term is going to be our rotational inertia. So that's something that we discussed during the previous week. Okay. So the only portion of the formula that I'm interested in is rotational force. Okay, tangential force times the distance to the axis of rotation is going to be torque. And when there's torque acting on a rotational mass or the moment of inertia, it's going to cause it to accelerate. So it's going to experience a rotational acceleration. So everything that we discussed is summarized in this formula. All right, so the tangential force times the distance to the point of rotation is going to give us the rotational force, which is known as the torque. And the rotational force acting on the mass arm is the moment of inertia. It's going to cause it to accelerate rotationally. That's it. Okay. So moving forward. Okay, so for the purpose of this week, all right, so we are talking about torque. Okay, so this force is going to be responsible for the rotation with respect to the pivot. The pivot is going to be this. R is known as the lever arm the radial distance to the point where the force is applied. Force is going to have two components. One is called the tangential component or the perpendicular component. It's got a parallel component. All right, so when you make a small triangle, the perpendicular component is going to be sine of the angle of F. So the perpendicular component of the force is going to be responsible for the rotational force or the torque. All right, so this is the main torque formula. It could be sine or cosine depending upon how it's set up. In this case, it's going to be sine of the angle because we're interested in the opposite, which is going to be force. It has to be perpendicular to the rotational axis. So the perpendicular component of the force is going to be responsible for the torque or the rotational force. The term R is the radial distance to the point of rotation, radial distance to the pivot, or otherwise known as the lever arm. All right, if the torque is in the kind of clockwise direction, it's going to be taken to be positive. If it's in the clockwise direction, is going to be taken to be negative. All right, so making transitions from linear work to rotational work. Work is a process of transferring energy. So the energy is going to get transferred. And there's a force acting on a mass and causing it to get displaced. So the energy is going to be transferred in the form of kinetic energy. All right, so the force could be expressed in terms of the rotational force, which is known as the torque. Displacement becomes the rotational displacement, which is theta. And changing kinetic energy becomes the change in rotational kinetic energy. All right, so work becomes the rotational work, force becomes torque, and displacement becomes the rotational displacement. So the rotational work is going to cause, it's going to transfer rotational kinetic energy. All right, so if there's a rotational torque acting on a system, a torque is going to cause the system to become displaced in the direction of the torque which means that the work is being done on the system, which means that the energy is being transferred to the system in the form of, in the form of um, rotational kinetic energy, which means that the rotational speed is going to go up. OK, this is weird. It's not working. I wonder why. OK, so we discussed this before. The this, this squirrel starts to get closer and closer to the bird feeder. What happens? The squirrel is going to speed up. So the question is why? The answer to that question is because of the conservation of angular momentum. So what is angular momentum? When a mass is moving at a given velocity, which we, we say that mass is momentum, which means that it's, it's moving in a given direction at a constant speed. All right, so if this mass is rigidly attached to a point of rotation just like that, it's going to experience angular momentum. Okay, so the mass moving at a given velocity becomes the momentum of that mass, and the momentum is in this direction. And notice that the momentum of this mass is going to be influenced by the fact that this mass is rigidly attached to a point, point of rotation. So which means that it's going to experience something called the angular momentum. All right, so this is your momentum term. When you take the linear momentum multiplied by the radial distance with respect to the point of rotation, it's going to give you the angular momentum. Right, so we do a back substitution, and then we come up with an angular momentum term. So this, this is the tangential velocity that could be expressed in terms of the rotational velocity. Okay, so we have R, R, so we end up getting R squared. MR squared is going to give us a rotational mass or moment of inertia. So we will do a back substitution. 
So we end up giving two expressions for the angular momentum. You can express it in terms of the tangential velocity, or you can express it in terms of the rotational velocity. All right, so your momentum is going to be conserved in the absence of an external force or external torque acting on a system, which means that the initial angular momentum is going to be the same as the final angular momentum. And once again, I'm expressing angular momentum either using the tangential velocity or angular velocity. So what's the meaning of the conservation of angular momentum in the form we can understand it? Okay, so for whatever reason, it's still not gonna work. So let's move forward. All right, so the meaning of it is this, if you're looking at it in terms of velocity, so angular momentum is gonna be constant in the absence of an external torque tightening on the system. So which means that if I bring the mass closer to the point of rotation, mass is gonna speed up. That's what it means. All right, so if you bring the mass closer to the point of rotation, simply it's going to speed up. If you move the mass away from the point of rotation, it's gonna slow down. Okay, so that's the game that we're playing. It's, the, it's called the conservation of angular momentum. The question is, what conserves angular momentum? The absence of an external force acting on the system. Absence of an external torque acting on the system. Which means if that's the case, angular momentum is gonna be conserved. Somehow, magically, if you bring the mass closer to the point of rotation, mass is gonna speed up. If you move the mass further away from the point of rotation, it's gonna slow down. And this explains everything that we we're discussing, every single video that we've seen up to this point. All right, so um, move the mass away from the point of rotation, it's gonna slow down. Bring the mass closer to the point of rotation, it's gonna speed up because angular momentum is gonna be constant. So the question is, when does angular momentum become constant? It becomes constant in the absence of an external force, in the absence of an external torque. So that's what conserves angular momentum. So that's one way of looking at it. Angular momentum is gonna be constant, or the second way of looking at it, angular momentum is going to be a combination of moment of inertia and the rotational velocity. Okay, so if you increase the moment of inertia, angular velocity is going to go down. If you reduce the moment of inertia, angular velocity is going to go up. Moment of inertia is related to the mass distribution. All right, if you stretch your arms, that's going to increase your moment of inertia. The speed is going to go down. If you pull the arms in, as well as the legs in, uh, you reduce the average distance between the mass and the point of rotation. So it's going to reduce the moment of inertia. As a result, Angular rotation is going to go up. Angular speed is going to go up. Okay. So let's take a look at this problem real fast. And there's a discussion that I want to have. There's something interesting that happens. Okay. So this is problem number five from the handout. So we got this figure skater. And she's able to increase her rotational speed by pulling her arms in. All right. So her rotational speed is going to go from one revolution every two seconds to a final state of three revolutions per, three revolutions per, per second. So what's happening is it's just, she's just speeding up. So it's going from half a revolution per second to three revolutions per second. We know her initial moment of inertia, which is given to us. So the question is, what is her final moment of inertia? All right, so this is problem number five. And then we will build up on this problem. There's something interesting here. All right, so initial rotational speed is going to half a revolution per second. Final rotational speed is three revolutions per second. Her initial moment of inertia is given, that's given 4.6. So the question is, what's her final moment of inertia? Okay, so we have to do conversions to the radians per second. So everything has to be expressed in terms of radians per second. All right, so there's no, there's no external torque acting on the system. There's no external force acting on her in the direction of rotation, so which means that the angular momentum is gonna be constant. We express the angular momentum in terms of the um, rotational mass, rotational inertia, moment of inertia. And we are interested in the final moment of inertia in this case. So we come up with an expression for the final moment of inertia, like the numbers in. And so which means that she has to reduce her moment of inertia by pulling her arms in. Okay, so her moment of inertia goes down from 4.6 to 0.76. Okay, the next question this is where things get kind of interesting is how much does the kinetic energy of the rotation change? Okay, guys, given the fact that there's no external force acting on the system. Okay, remember the work done it, by doing work, you end up transferring energy. And the amount of energy that you transfer is going to be transferred in the form of kinetic energy. It depends on the amount of work which is being done on the system. There's no external force being done on the system. So does this mean that there's no change in energy of the system? All right, so let's take a look at the change in kinetic energy of the system. Rotational kinetic energy of the system. And so uh, you've got the initial rotational speed to final rotational speed. You know that the moment of inertia is going to change. And then we got a bunch of numbers, plug the numbers in, and all of a sudden you notice that the rotational kinetic energy of the system goes up. All right, so the rotational kinetic energy of the system goes up. So the question is, where did that energy come from? 
guys, there's no work being done on the system by an external force. So if that's the case, where do we get the energy from? All right, so I'm going to open the room for discussion. Obviously, she's getting kinetic energy, so the question is from where? Where's she getting the kinetic energy from? What do you guys think? The rotation of kinetic energy going up. All right, I'm going to give you 20 points for the best answer. Where did she get the extra energy from? No work is being done by an external force, obviously, in the system. Nothing. There's no external torque acting on the system. Yeah, she's getting kinetic energy. So the question is, where did she? Where is she getting the kinetic energy from? Is it like with the pole vaulting scenario where she's getting it from her muscles? Uh, give yourself twenty points. Beautiful. Absolutely. Okay. Those Lucia, you make the same point. Both of you guys give yourself twenty points. Okay. Notice that the internal force matters in this case, right? Remember, it was, it was gravity is the only one which is acting on the planets, and obviously there's work being done somehow because. When you pull your arms in, you're doing work on your arms by pulling them in. All right, you apply a force on their arms. So which means the energy is coming from the muscles. Okay, so uh, the muscles, as we, as we discussed before, it uses chemical energy, so it turns into heat and then it turns into mechanical energy. So there's an internal force at work. Okay, the work being done, done by the internal force. The overall energy of the system is not changing. What's happening in essence is the energy is getting converted from chemical energy into the, into the um, rotational kinetic energy of the system in essence. Okay, system as a whole still has the same total energy, except there's a conversion process that takes place. When you apply a force on the mass, mass of your arms, and then just pull them in, you're doing, in essence, there's a work being done on your arms. So that, that the energy gets converted, they, that, that chemical energy gets converted to heat, and then it gets converted into obviously energy and motion, the rotation of motion and so forth. All right, so that's where we end up getting the extra energy from. All right, so we end up getting the extra energy from there. Just This is just for the hell of it, because I was just curious about this. This is one of those weird concepts that you have to be careful for. So there's going to be changing kinetic energy, which means that things will either speed up or slow down depending upon their positions because of the conservation of angular momentum, which means that there's no external force acting on the system, which also means that there's no external torque acting on the system, which means that the overall energy of the system is going to be conserved under the circumstances. But when you actually change the rotational inertia, moment of inertia, when there's a change in the rotational inertia of the system, this is your initial angular velocity, this is your final angular velocity. If your final angular velocity is larger, which means that you're in essence gaining kinetic energy, if it's smaller, you're losing kinetic energy. That's what it means. So kinetic energy of the system can change. This is a weird concept. Right, so this is the conservation of angular momentum. Um, problem number six. Okay, um, 7.30 guys, take a break for 10. Okay, so... <clears throat> Okay, so speaking of figure skating, problem number six. This is more of a mathematical exercise. All right, so we're gonna figure out the angular momentum of a figure sp skater with her arms close to her body. And we will assume that her body looks like a uniform cylinder. It's got a certain amount of height, radius, and the mass. And then how much torque is required to stop her from spinning. Okay, so it's a simple mathematical exercise. So she's initially spinning at, at three and a half revolutions per second. Mm -hmm. All right, so she's, her height is gonna be one and a half meters. It's, her radius is 15 centimeters. I love these book problems. <clears throat> okay, so figure out the angular momentum and then the torque required to stop her from spinning within five seconds. So she's gonna go from three and a half revolutions to zero within five seconds. So revolution per second needs to be expressed in terms of radians per second. Okay, so what else do we have? That's it. All right, so the angular momentum. So this is the one that we will get to use. Uh, moment of inertia times the angular velocity. So we're gonna be looking at our initial angular velocity. So the moment of inertia for the cylinder is gonna be solid cylinder. So it's gonna be one half time R squared. So that's what we will get to use. So we'll do a back substitution. And okay, so we got the mass, we got the radius, okay, and we know the initial rotational speed. So that's her total angular momentum. So we came up with an expression. So the next question is what's the amount of torque required to stop her from spinning? Okay, so here's the torque formula. So we got the angular rotation times angular um, mass, angular inertia, moment of inertia times the rotational acceleration. So the moment of inertia is this one. So we'll just grab this and just pull it into that formula. Okay, so the rotational acceleration in this case is gonna depend on how the rotation is gonna take place. 
Okay, let's assume that the rotation is going to happen at a constant rotational acceleration, so which means that we will get the kick from three formulas. The easiest one to use is the one in the middle, because we know the initial angular velocity, we know the final is going to come to stop, we know it's going to take five seconds, so we know t. So just sub for alpha and do a back substitution. So sub for alpha, final velocity is going to be zero, right, so we will do a back substitution. All right, so this is how the final equation looks like. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, so it's gonna be a rotational torque. Rotational torque is gonna be in the opposite direction of the spin. That's the reason why we got a negative sign. Spin velocity is gonna be going in a, whatever the direction of this is, the torque is gonna apply in the opposite direction. Right, so we got the mass, once again, we know the radius. Don't forget to square it. You got the initial rotational speed in terms of radians per second. And then we got the time, so then we end up getting an expression for the rotational force or the torque. All right, so there's a second solution, possible solution. Okay, force is how fast the momentum changes in time. We could do a transition or transformation. So the force becomes the rotational force, the momentum becomes the angular momentum. So the rotational force, the torque, is how fast the angular momentum changes in time. All right, so a change in angular momentum is you go from an initial angular momentum to a final angular momentum. Initial angular momentum was zero. And we got the final angular momentum. Uh, actually, the final angular momentum is supposed to be zero. It's an initial angular momentum, but it doesn't matter. The answer would be a negative of whatever it is that we're looking at. All right. I got the number right, but the concept just went to hell. I wasn't paying attention. All right, so what else do we have? <clears throat> okay, so seeing this one. Okay, guys, okay. Okay, the conservation of angular momentum is the conservation of angular momentum of a system. Okay, the system may be composed of the sun and the planet and the planets, for example, or a system could be a person spinning with some weights on his hand. Okay, so. Don't go too fast, so. Okay, now hold them in. It's going to be constant. All right, so there's not going to be any change in angular momentum. When you bring your masses in, the tangential velocity is going to go up. And then back out again. When you move the masses away from the point of rotation, the tangential velocity is going to go down. You move the masses towards the center of rotation, the moment of inertia is going to go down. The rotational speed is going to go up. So conservation of angular momentum. So that's your conservation of angular momentum. Okay. The one that I really like is this one. When you have a spinning wheel. <laughs> okay, so the, our system is going to be this wheel as well as the person holding on to it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you go back the other way. You should stop again because now all the angular momentum is in the wheel again. <laughs> okay, so when he turns it this way, notice that this wheel spins one direction and his body spins the other way. Because the total angular momentum of the system is going to be constant. All right, so the wheel is going to slow down a little bit as his body starts to spin in the opposite direction. Stop. And then turn sure, it and then go all the way up. And then, and then he comes to the back and just starts to spin back in the opposite direction. Okay, this is so weird. Why is that not able to play this medium? All right. Okay, this is <clears throat> yeah. Check out motion is hundred percent predictable. And this guy's trying to land on top of these cars. Why on, the, on top of these cars? Because this is your crumble zone. They're trying to increase the impact time. They're trying to make it survivable. Given the fact that projectile motion is hundred percent predictable, why is it that they're not succeeding this time? Is it ramp? Is a known measured distance? He's got a calculated speed. He's jumping because he reached the speed. Somehow he's falling short. The question is why? Why is he falling short? He's falling short because the car is angling the wrong way. The car is angling the wrong way, and the question is why? You're thinking the car is angling the wrong way because the engine is heavy. I'm thinking, thank you again. Okay, that's a, that's a rookie mistake. You're not supposed to be making that mistake right now. Free fall, everything should be falling at the same rate, so the weight doesn't matter. The reason why the car is angling the wrong way is because this guy ended up applying his brakes. He was probably told not to, and reflexively he engaged the brakes. So what happens when he engaged the brakes? The conservation of total, it's the conservation of angular momentum. The tires are spinning at a given speed, and as soon as you lock up the brakes, what happens? The spin motion is gonna get transferred to the car, so he locks up the brakes immediately. The total angular momentum of the system is constant, so now the car is gonna start to turn in the direction of the spin of the tires. So what does that do? Now he's offering a tremendous amount of profile against the wind, which means that the vehicle is going to experience a tremendous amount of air friction, acceleration 
how long the x direction is no longer zero. The acceleration becomes a factor. The motion is no longer predictable. This guy is falling significantly short because of it. The only thing he had to do was not touch the brake. He did. So what happened? The spin motion got transferred to the vehicle. The vehicle started to turn in the direction of the spin of the tires before the tires were engaged. So we have seen this before. It's the same idea. Notice that the total angular momentum of the system was zero. Now, as soon as he starts to run in the clockwise direction, I think he's going to start to move in the opposite direction. Using the principle of conservation of angular momentum to turn the because the angular momentum is going to be constant. Way through the drop, the cat is rotating, and then at the very end, Gigi somehow stops rotating. Newton's first law says that an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted on by an external force. I see no external forces on this cat. So what's happening here? It's not making sense to me. Okay, so in order to really get the right data, we're gonna have to drop her 90 degrees out of phase. Ready, girl? This time, watch your tail. Three, two, one. <laughs> Okay, so you think you figured it out? Check this out. You probably noticed that when the cat was falling, her tail was rotating in the direction opposite of where her body was rotating. What's interesting about that is that that's not how it works. In fact, even bobtail cats can do this. It's called the cat riding reflex. I'll prove it to you. I came across some video from the 60s when the Air Force was researching microgravity for future astronauts. Turns out they took some cats up on parabolic flights. He tries to rotate his tail to flip over, but it doesn't work. He just ends up mutating wildly. Then he does something interesting. He takes his back and he bends it. And when he bends his back and then creates motion, something interesting happens. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. So let me show you one more cat flip with a mirror, and we'll figure this out. Okay, the arch back ends up being pretty important. Uh, what he does is he divides his body up into two separate rotational axes that are tilted from one another. When he's released, he pulls his front paws in and does the ice skater trick. He decreases his moment of inertia in the front so he can spin fast up there. But in the back, he pushes his legs away from him, increasing his moment of inertia. So a really large twist in the front equals a really small twist in the back in the opposite direction, and the torques equal out. So as soon as he gets his front paws in under him, all he has to do is extend those legs back out to increase that moment of inertia and stop the front twist, and extend his back legs along that rear axis. That allows him to twist those around really fast, and then all he has to do is pull them back in under his body, and then extend all four legs and brace for impact. So thank you for your attention. I hope you learned something pretty cool about cats. If you don't mind, <laughs> okay, okay, I'm done, I'm done. If you would, go check out your other cat videos after trying to catch Gigi. Woo. A little too rowdy. If you'd like to, click Gigi the cat to subscribe. We'd appreciate it. I hope you had a good one. And uh, you gotta catch it first. I got it. You want it? Very cool cat. She let us drop her hundreds of times. Or, you know, maybe just five. Want your ball? Go get it. Click her if you want to subscribe. Nope. For right now, we're playing fetch. Ready? Go get it. Back and then creates motion, something interesting. Took some ends up being pretty important. Okay, I love the explanation. So, we'll There's no net torque acting on the cat. There's no external torque acting. Figure this out. So, which means that the angular momentum of the cat is getting constant. It's conserved. A couple of things that the cat does, which is remarkable. Okay, the arch back ends up being pretty He provided a real good explanation for it as well. Important. Uh, what he does is he divides his body up into two separate rotational axes that are tilted from one another. When he's released, he pulls. Okay, so this segment is going to rotate first. Okay, so the cat ends up arching her back. All right, so there's going to be one rotational axis going this way, and there's going to be a second rotational axis going the other way. This right. is front paws in. So the cat is going to end up in the front paws in. So what does that do? It's going to reduce the moment of inertia, right? So what happens when you reduce the moment of inertia? inertia. It's going to increase the rotational speed. It decreases his moment of inertia in the front, so he can spin faster there. All right, so end up spinning faster in that direction. Okay, so what happens with the hind legs is important. Okay, he, the cat is stretched. The cat stretches but in the back, his hind leg, increasing the moment of inertia here. Okay, by increasing the moment of inertia, it's able to reduce the rotational speed. So the front end is going to be rotating faster than the back end. It's his legs away from him, increasing his moment of inertia. So a really large twist in the front equals... So a large twist in the front and smaller twist in the back. So a really back. small twist in the back in the opposite direction, and the torques equal out. The opposite direction, very good. So as soon as he gets his front paws in under him, all he has to do is extend those legs back out. Okay, now it's going to be extended to increase that moment. So that's going to increase the moment of inertia, but that's going to reduce the spin motion. Moment of inertia and stop the front twist and extend... Extend his back legs along that rear axis. That allows him to twist those around really fast. Okay, now it's, the cat is going to end up pulling the legs in. That's going to reduce the moment of inertia. Fast, and then only has it says, 
So which means that rotational speed of the back end is gonna go. Do is pull the back end under his body and then extend all four legs and brace for impact. Okay, don't forget you can't have extra muscle. Right? So which means that they're gonna be able to increase the impact and reduce the acceleration. Okay, the arch back makes a big difference. Okay, so this is also gonna increase the impact. Now look at the way the body absorbs. The impact. This is so beautifully done. It's me. That's the most. All right, so speaking of Kepler's laws, I think we kind of got the answer for that one. So it's this video conservation of angular momentum. We'll focus okay, I'm gonna, the on constant velocity. Yeah, focus on a few things. This is the angular it's a demonstration video. Angular momentum can I, the way they used to do this sort of stuff, which is not very exciting. Easily be demonstrated with the squeezatron. Squeezatron, which has a pair. Okay, I love this. Pair of masses <laughs> revolving about a fixed axis. All right, so just get but it the arguments are first. the same as for one mass. A cord can be pulled within the axis, which okay. So as soon as you pull the but cord, doesn't in. pulling the cord interfere with the mass? Answer: Your the pure instruction quantity distance of the masses from the central axis. Let's start by placing the masses in motion so that they have angular momentum about the central axis. We can then pull the cord, which will move the masses closer to the axis of rotation. Let's first explore our understanding of angular momentum with a pure instruction question. The string on the apparatus will shortly be pulled, moving the masses closer to the central axis. What will happen? Okay, guys, let's take a vote on this one. Is it A, B, C, D, D, or E? All right, put down your responses in the chat. Right, this was too easy for you guys. Give yourself five points. <clears throat> so angular momentum is going to be constant. If you bring the masses close to the point of rotation, it, it's just going to speed up, right? So the best Please record your vote on a piece of paper. Angular momentum of the, the video. The answer is B. Remember that angular momentum is a conserved quantity. Thus, the angular momentum of the masses before we pull the cord is the same as that after. Initially, that value is L equals M times V times R for each mass. As we pull the cord, the radius R decreases as the masses now move on a circle of smaller radius. Okay, so we got around that. the axis, the object, while the okay, so conservation of angular momentum also explains angular momentum is the ice. Why the planets speed up is they get closer to the sun a spin and slow down as they start moving away. And pulling in their arms. As more of their mass becomes located, the dashed line represents. In this simulator, we show an object in an elliptical orbit about the sun. The purple arrow represents the velocity v of the object, while the red dashed line represents the distance r to the sun. Note that due to conservation of angular momentum, when r is large, the velocity v is relatively small. Conversely, when the distance r is small... Okay, so, <clears throat> because there is no net force, external force acting on the system. Um, when you bring the mass near the point of rotation, it's going to speed up. When you move the mass away, it's just going to slow down. So that explains the Kepler's observations. Holding the dumbbell apparatus, which pulls the in the weights, they will spin much more rapidly due to the conservation of angular momentum. If the demonstrator extends their arms, everything has them. Okay, let's move forward. Let's talk about the collapsing star. Stars collapsing into black holes. The three-dimensional version of this demonstration is known as a Hoberman sphere. In this apparatus, a string hangs below the apparatus, which pulls the entire structure into a smaller sphere. Okay, so when a star collapses into a black hole, if we it's going to end up initially put the sphere faster rotating faster, and then so pull the string. It's going to accelerate. Spins much more rapidly. This is similar to what occurs on a larger scale during the early stages of star formation. As a protostar contracts gravitationally, it will rotate more rapidly. When our sun was at the early stages of collapse, it rotated extremely slowly. As it collapsed down to its present size, its rotation rate increased. When more massive stars near the end of their lives become neutron stars, they shrink down to the size of a city. They then rotate extremely rapidly, up to multiple times per second, sending out beams of radiation along their magnetic axis that appear to us as flashes, all due to the conservation of angular momentum. For decades, the Winter Olympic Games has drawn people from across the world to marvel at breathtaking athletics on the snow and ice. One of the most popular events is figure skating. Athletes meld acrobatics, dance, and physics into mesmerizing performances. It is the sheer precision that separates the skilled athlete from the novice. Through years of tireless training, skaters must learn to understand and use angular momentum to become the best in their sport. Angular momentum is the product of a skater's moment of inertia and angular velocity and is represented by the letter L. When the skater is rotating with no net external torque acting on her, angular momentum is conserved. With her arms and leg outward, she increases her moment of inertia, which reduces her angular velocity. As she pulls her arms and leg inward, she is able to spin faster since her angular velocity increases while her moment of inertia decreases. And this is how skaters become champions.
from Olympic champion Evan Lysacek. Imagine what it's like to hurl your body in the air and rotate four times. To Olympic hopeful Ashley Wagner. This is what I've been working for my entire career. Figure skaters push themselves through incredible jumps, spins, lifts, and throws on ice and make it look elegant and effortless. From your starting position to your very last movement and even the way you get off the ice, every detail counts. Making the difficult elements look effortless takes exceptional artistry, athleticism, and a solid understanding of some basic principles of physics. There's no better example of physics than on an ice skating rink. It's a wonderful place to see science. T plus fun. Brad Orr is the head of the physics department at the University of Michigan and has been funded by the National Science Foundation. Orr explains that good balance or stability is basic to everything a skater does. And that begins with an understanding of the center of mass, the balance point in which an object's mass is concentrated. This is easiest to see in a completely symmetric object like a basketball. The center of mass is at the center of the sphere. As you get to objects which have less symmetry, it's a little harder to figure it out, but it's still the center of where the object is. The center of mass for a figure skater is usually in the hip area, well above the feet or point of support. Well, here we come to a situation which is unstable, and this is what the figure skater actually has. Her center mass is up around her hips, and her skates are touching the ice down here. A figure skater's center of mass must be kept directly above the point of support to maintain balance, adjusting as positions change. This becomes even more challenging in pair skating and ice dancing, which require that both skaters keep their centers of mass over the point of support, through lifts, throats, and complicated positions. Okay, so the question is, what is the center of mass? <laughs> center of mass is your center of balance. Okay, so the center of mass is going to look at it right here, obviously, because that's the center of balance of this thing. Okay, so this brings us to the point of equilibrium. So what is considered equilibrium? Okay, so there are three cases of equilibrium. I am very surprised at that. Ooh. Uh, and... Okay, guys, I have to stop this one more time. Okay, this computer really messed things up. Stable. Unstable. We'll need to know the definitions for stable, unstable, and neutral equilibrium. Now, notice that it's equilibrium. When I take and I just Okay, so the ball is going to be in a neutral equilibrium. So the neutral is the one that you're interested in. Always focus on the center mass. Center of mass is going to be the center of geometry in this case. When you displace it, center of mass is going to move trans translationally. So it's, there's going to be a linear motion, but the center of mass is not going to go up or down. So which means that the center of mass is going to have a constant potential energy. Therefore, it does not gain gravitational It doesn't gain any gravitational potential energy. So there's no change of gravitational potential energy of the center of mass. So if there's no change in gravitational potential energy of the center of mass when you apply a force on it, it's known as the neutral equilibrium. Right. That is neutral equilibrium. Okay, now the marker, on the other hand, when you look at it. Well, if I just right? That is equilibrium. Okay, so when you apply a force on it and cause a displacement, the center of mass is gonna decrease. Center of mass of the marker is located around here somewhere. All right, so as soon as you apply a force on it, its potential energy is gonna go down. Okay, so this is known as the unstable equilibrium. Right. So any force, external force acting on it, is gonna change its potential energy of the center of mass. It's gonna reduce this potential energy of the center of mass, so that makes it an unstable. If I displace it from its equilibrium position, it will decrease the gravitational potential energy. So its gravitational potential energy is gonna decrease as soon as you displace it from its position of equilibrium. And therefore, follow. this is stable equilibrium. Okay, so stable equilibrium, notice that it's causing a displacement by applying a force on it, center of mass end up going up relative to the tabletop, which means that center of mass gains some gravitational potential energy. When you let it go, center of mass is going to go back to its original position. It goes back, right? When I so when you apply a force on it, you're able to increase the gravitational potential energy of the center of mass. When you let it go, it goes back to its equilibrium. When you displace position. it, the center of mass actually goes up and the gravitational potential energy increases. Now notice that this is only stable to a certain So it's called the stable equilibrium. Point. Now, if you can get the center of mass over the point, of the edge. Right. So All right, so the point of rotation is right here. If you can get the center of mass over the point of rotation, like the top one, it's going to... And this graph actually not quite look like that, but that is the difference between stable, unstable, and neutral. It's going to roll over. All right, so if you can get it by pushing on it, the center of mass is located here. This is the point of rotation. If you can get the center of mass over the point of rotation, at that point, it's going to roll over. To a certain point, right? Let me check, let's check to see if he's going to do that. Okay, this is... Stable would actually have to be a perfect point. I didn't have to be able to balance it properly, which I wasn't going to try in front of the class, because it wouldn't work. 
Okay, so I'll move forward. <clears throat> if a body remains stationary in its position, we say that it is in equilibrium. When we move this ball slightly to one side, it will remain in the new position. Okay, so center mass, the position of the center mass doesn't change, so now you're looking at a neutral equilibrium. We say that the ball is in neutral equilibrium. When we move a ball along the surface of a hemispherical ball... Okay, now this is if you move it from its equilibrium position. Uh, point. Forces, so what's going to happen is it turns into an unstable this will appear, equilibrium because of the simple reason that it's center mass, gravitational potential energy of the center mass is going to go down. Yeah, they tend to make the ball move farther away from the position of equilibrium. We can therefore say that a ball on the top of a sphere is going to be an unstable equilibrium. Is in unstable equilibrium. When we now move the ball slightly to one side, forces appear that will make the ball return to. Okay, so when you move it from the equilibrium position, you're by applying a force on it, you increase its gravitational potential energy. And when you let it go, gravitational potential is going to decrease while it's restoring itself to its position of equilibrium. So this is known as the stable equilibrium. Its original position of equilibrium. We can therefore say that at the bottom of the ball, the ball is in a position of stable equilibrium. If a body remains. Right, so speaking of equilibrium. <laughs> this system is also in equilibrium. So what are the conditions for equilibrium? All right, so this system is in equilibrium. Because of the simple reason that net force acting on the system is going to be zero. All right, so net force acting on the rope is going to be zero. There's an amount of pull in this <laughs> It's going to be matched by the amount of pull in the opposite direction. So the net force acting on the system is going to be zero. Okay. So that's the condition for equilibrium. The net force acting on the system has to be zero. Okay. So we looked at the horizontal forces. Now take a look at the vertical forces. You got a book on a tabletop. It's got weight, so gravity is pulling it down. It's sitting on a tabletop, so it's also experiencing a normal force. Force of gravity is in the downward direction. The normal force is in the upward direction. So we got two forces acting on the system. The net force is zero because these forces are equal to each other. All right. So First condition of equilibrium is, equilibrium is the net force acting on the system has to be zero. The second requirement for equilibrium is net torque has to be zero. If there's a torque acting on a system, notice that the system is going to accelerate rotationally. All right, so the net force acting on the system is zero, but the net torque acting on the system is not zero. Okay, so the meter stick, or this stick, is going to actually spin relative to the point of rotation in the middle. It's going to experience a torque. All right, so which means the second condition of equilibrium is not satisfied when there's a torque acting on the system. So there are two conditions. First condition is for equilibrium. Net force acting on the system has to be zero. So the net force on the x direction, y direction, and z direction has to be zero. So that's the first condition for equilibrium. Second condition for equilibrium is the net torque acting on the system has to be zero. Okay, so these are known as the conditions for equilibrium. All right, pick up the investment I just put in the chat. <clears throat> Okay, very good. Give yourself five points. So this <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's do a simple problem. <clears throat> okay, guys, this is, I'm going to give you a bunch of problems to focus on for this particular task. <clears throat> okay, so this is one of the problems that you need to focus on. So that this is conditions for equilibrium problem number 10. All right, so what do we have? We got a person standing on a board, diving board, and she's 58 kilograms, so she's got some weight in this direction. So it says calculate the forces that's acting on the diving board that we, we got acting on it. So calculate the forces that, that the sports exerts on the diving board. A person is standing on a dive, diving board. Okay. I'm going to do part A of this problem. Part B of the problem is something that you have to do yourself, so that's going to be your homework. Okay. I would recommend that you work on this problem because your test problem is going to be similar to this one. Okay, um, question number 10 is not worded correctly. It says calculate the torque about the front post with relative to B of a diving board exerted by a 50, 58 kilogram person three meters from, from that post. Okay, so, so that's not the problem that we will get to solve. This is the problem that we will get to solve. Uh, so I uh, just go back to the PowerPoint. I'm gonna reprint this and then find this problem. This is the one that we will get to solve because that's the one which is a pro meaningful problem, not the other one. Okay. So we're going to do everything relative to point B. Okay, so we will do the computations relative to point B. So that point B is going to be our pivot point. The first thing we need to do is we need to identify the forces. So the diving board is sitting on top of A and B. Our B is going to be our pivot point. So which means that diving board is resting on B. So there's going to be a normal force right there. And A, obviously, it's attached to A. So there's a force acting on it in the downward direction. Okay, it's either nailed down or it's been glued in this direction. 
So there's a force that's pulling it in this direction. And then on top of that, this person is gonna have weight. So W is gonna represent the weight. All right, so the first thing we need to do is we need to do a force diagram. All right, so this is gonna be the weight of this person. So it's gonna be NG. Our point is gonna be our pivot. Okay, the pivot is gonna be normal force because the board is resting up on top of that, uh, that column at B. And then somehow the boarding board is attached to A, so it's, it's either glued or nailed down. So there's a force acting on it in the downward direction. So L1 is gonna be the length or the distance with force relative to the point of rotation uh, expressed in terms of the force in the downward direction. So you got L2 is the distance of the weight the person relative to the point of rotation, which is the pivot point. Okay, so what are we interested in? We, are in, we need to figure out, we know the weight of this person. So the question is what is N, that point B, and what is the support force? F1, right, so we know the mass of the person. So L1 is gonna be one meter. L2 is gonna be three meters. Okay, so figure out the support force, support force, and then figure out and the normal force. What is F1, the support force, in terms of Newtons and pounds, and what is the normal force in terms of Newtons and pounds? Okay, so what do we have? We got two unknowns, which means that we need to have two equations. So because of the fact that we need two equations for two unknowns, we got two unknowns, we need to have two equations for. Okay. So we want the system to be in equilibrium. So the equilibrium will have two conditions. Number one, net force has to be zero. So the forces are along the y direction. All right, so F1 is in the downward direction, N is in the upward direction, W is in the downward direction. All right, so F1 is in the downward direction negative, N is in the upward direction, that's positive. W is in the downward direction, so it's gonna be negative. Net force along the y direction has to be zero for the system to be equilibrium. Okay, we know the weight, so the weight is unknown. F1 is unknown, N is unknown. I'm gonna keep my unknowns on the left-hand side. So that's what I'm doing. Okay, so the weight by definition is gonna be mg. All right, so that's our first expression. Okay, so you still need to come up with one more equation All right, because we still have two unknowns. The second one, we can come up with the second equation. That's the condition for, second condition for equilibrium. The net torque has to be zero. Okay, so the torque, net torque of the system has to be zero. Remember, torque is gonna be expressed or measured with relative to the pivot point. So the first force is gonna cause the torque relative to the pivot point. So the force times displacement, the sine of the angle of 90. Okay, so, and notice that this is gonna cause a counterclockwise displacement. So that's a positive torque. L1 times F1 times sine of the angle 90 degrees is gonna be one. Okay, the second force is gonna cause by, the second torque is gonna cause by the weight. So the weight is in this direction, the lever arm, relative to the pivots is gonna be L2. So it's gonna be L2 times W. And this is gonna cause, cause a negative torque. So L2 times Mg. All right, so net torque will cause a rotational acceleration. So there's no rotational acceleration. So the net torque is gonna be zero. And then we end up getting a nice looking term. So we can solve this for F1. And once we get F1, we can solve for N2, N over there. Okay, so we came up with an expression for F1 the numbers in at that point. We got the force in terms of newtons and in terms of pounds. So this is our support force. And then just go back and plug this into the first equation right there. Solve for n. All right, so this is gonna be that number. It's gonna be 500 pounds, the normal force. All right, guys, if you have two unknowns, you need to have two equations. You get the equations from the Conditions of equilibrium. Conditions for equilibrium. So the net force is gonna be zero, the net torque is gonna be zero. If you got two unknowns, this is how you generate two equations. All right, so this is a ladder. Uh, obviously standing up against the wall and you don't want this ladder to slip. You know, so, all right, so this is problem number 11. So what do we have? We got a ladder leaning against the smooth wall. Okay, and uh, so we've got the length of the ladder. It's gonna be 20 feet. It weighs 50 pounds. It's set set at an angle of 60 degrees with respect to the ground. So determine the value of the forces acting on it from the ground and the wall. Okay, so a couple of things about this. Um, number one, identify the center of mass. All right, so center of mass is gonna be right at the center of geometry in this case. The weight is gonna be applied to the center of mass. Okay, so the weight is gonna be mg. So now we've gotta identify the forces. All right, so when you guys taking statics, you will get to do this like a billion times. They will give you these systems. You have to identify the, the forces, the action forces. You have to identify the reaction forces. And you have all sorts of reaction forces that you have to identify. All right, so the weight is the action force. 
So it's going to apply a push pulling the downward direction. It's resting on the surface, and it's also resting on the wall. Okay, so you will have reaction forces from the surface, and you will have reaction forces from the wall. Okay, so a couple of things we will get from this surface and that surface. All right, so now we've got to identify those forces. All right, it's resting against the wall, so there's going to be a normal force from that direction. So I'm going to call this the push. And there's going to be friction acting on this, uh, because it's going to feel a push in this direction, so there's going to be a frictional force acting on it, preventing it from skidding. Okay, so let's call this the ground force on the x direction. We don't have to call it the frictional force. I don't want to make it that complicated. So there's going to be a ground force acting on, on the x direction. That's in essence the static frictional force. It's also resting on the surface, so there's going to be a normal force in this direction. So we'll call that the ground force on the y direction. Okay, in statics, when you guys take statics, you will have to identify these forces. In reality, this is your frictional force, static friction force. You guys, when I give you a test, uh, on your test, this is, I must have gotten it from a book, and it talks about ground forces, this and that. I'll make it more realistic. I may ask you to find the coefficient of friction for static friction or something. All right, so I can't, it'll get slightly more complicated. And this would be the normal force from the ground. This would be the pushes a normal force from, from the wall. Okay. So this would be the static frictional force from the surface. And you know, there's also going to be a static frictional force from that surface, from the wall. Now, I make this statement, and some of the statements are important. It says it's a smooth wall. When it says it's a smooth wall, what it means is that this is a frictionless wall. So which means that you can ignore the frictional force from the wall. Okay. This is set up as a math problem. A lot of the engineering problems will, set, will be set up as a math problem. If I wanted to ask you a real physics problem, I would probably include this force as well. And all of a sudden, you would have four unknowns requiring four equations. So this is more of an example demonstration problem. So what do we have? So P is the push from the wall, so that's the normal force from the wall. G means it's just the ground force, so it's going to have two components. All right, so the force, the force is generated by the ground, so there are two forces generated by the ground. You got the frictional force and you have the normal force. W is the weight, <coughs> whatever. So this is a nice simpli simplistic problem. Oh, <laughs> I'm losing my voice. All right, now this is 20 feet. W is 50 pounds. All right, so what is the normal force from the wall? So that's the push. What is the frictional force, the ground force on the extraction? And what is the um, normal force from the ground on the y direction? All right, so what do we have? We got the angle 60 degrees. We are done with the conversions. Okay, so how do we do a problem like that? Straightforward. You got three unknowns, so which means that you have to come up with three equations. It's more of a math problem at this point. So three equations to solve for three unknowns. Okay. So I can generate two equations. I can generate three equations. In All right. So net force has to be zero. So we got forces on the x direction. So the net force on the x direction has to be zero. Also, we have forces on the y direction. This is a force on the y direction. So it's this one. So the net force on the y direction has to be zero. So that's my equation number two. The last thing is the torque. Net torque has to be zero. Net torque has to be zero. Okay. So this is where it gets kind of weird. In terms of looking at the net torque, you have to pick a pivot, right? You got two pivots that you can use. Either you can measure the torque with respect to the ground, or you can measure the torque with respect to the wall. Okay, it's a completely, it's, it's a personal choice. We usually pick the pivot with respect to the one that's gonna simplify the problem. All right, so depending upon what you need, if you put it here, obviously you got two forces to deal with. If you put your pivot here, you don't have to worry about these forces when you're looking at the net torque. Only thing you have to worry about these two forces. If you put your pivot here, you got three forces to contend. Okay. All right. So at this point, everything that I'm saying is blah blah blah. But when you start to work on it, you will understand the benefits of it. Okay. So let's come up with three equations. So net force on the x direction. All right. This is positive. This one is negative. So g of x minus p is going to equal to zero. All right. That's my first equation. All right, so now look at the net force on the y direction. So what do we have? G of y is in the upward direction, positive. W is in the downward direction, pointing in the downward direction, so it's negative. So G of y is in the upward direction. W is pointing in the downward direction. So net force is going to be equal to zero. That's my second equation. All right, we still have three unknowns, obviously. All right, so which means that we have to come up with the third equation. So the third equation is going to come from the net torque, not the decision time. Okay, so where do we want to place the pivot? Either place it here, or we can place it there. Okay. So uh, before I do the pivot thing, okay. Now this angle is important, right? And this point, the center mass is going to experience the torque with respect to R, 
okay, the radial distance. So this would be the lever arm. So we need to know what to do with this angle and where to put that angle. Okay, guys. So this is your radial distance to the point where the force is applied to. All right, the torque is going to be caused by the component of W, which is perpendicular to the radial axis. Okay, so what that means is we're going to place our pivot right here. Okay, I should have specified that. Okay, while well, I'm preparing a lecture on my own, it's not the same as the lecture itself because during the lecture, you pay a little bit more attention. So normally during the lecture, I would specify that this is where the pivot is. All right, so you have to kind of convince yourself by using identical triangles. This is your triangle. All right, so this triangle is going to be identical to this triangle that you're looking at. So this angle is going to be the same as this angle. All right, now all of a sudden, if you're looking at the component of this force, the weight, which is going to be perpendicular to the radial axis, notice that this component is not going to be the sine of the angle. This is going to be cosine of the angle. So you cannot do these problems blindly. All right, the torque equation, if you're using the right angle, obviously it's going to be the sine of the angle. And, and ex exactly what it is, it depends on your setup. It could be sine, it could be cosine, so you have to be really careful. So whatever you're doing, your math, this is the part of the reason I emphasize that you guys understand the concepts. Okay, the torque is a concept from physics that could be expressed using the right-hand rule, but that's not the only way you can express it. Okay. <clears throat> that's not the only way you can express it. All right, so now that we discussed this, so now this becomes 90 degrees to that. Uh, it becomes the cosine of the angle. So moving forward, all right, so our pivot is going to be expressed like that. <clears throat> and this is the torque <clears throat> that we got. OK, so I end up putting my pivot down. All right, so uh, this is going to cause a clockwise rotation. So it's going to be half the distance uh, times W, the cosine of the angle of W. All right, so that's W is going to be included. OK, so we don't have to contend with these two forces. The other force that we have to worry about is this P. All right, so P is going to have a component, the perpendicular component, which is going to be this. So this is opposite of that component. So this one is going to be sine of that angle. All right, and this is going to be responsible for counterclockwise torque. So this one is going to be positive. So that's going to be equal to zero. All right, so I generated three equations. I got three unknowns. The rest is just substitution, back and forth substitutions. Okay, so you can do it any way you want. All right, so along the x direction, you end up figuring out the y component of the ground force. Uh, by using the torque equation, you can figure out what P is. All right. And then lastly, using the first equation, you can figure out the x component of the ground force, and then you're done. A school bus carrying dozens of Elizabeth preschool students overturned this afternoon on Route 78 exit in the north. The bus, the second in a caravan of four Volani bus company vehicles, overturned shortly after 2 p.m. on the eastbound ramp of exit 57, which leads to Route 29. The buses were taking the children back to Proceed Inc., where they spent the morning at Mellick's Town Farm in Oakland, touring the farm. All the children were taken to area hospitals for evaluation. How easy is it for these school buses to roll over? Would they roll over first and then maybe skid off the road? Or would they just skid off the road first and then roll over? All right, so that becomes the question. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is, because we spent so much time working on it. So what is the maximum speed that the vehicle is gonna skid off the road? Okay, when I talk about a road, I'm talking about a ramp or a curve. All right, so we've done this stuff before. All right, so uh, what's the maximum speed at which the vehicle is gonna go into skid on a curve that we're looking at? Okay, so at number one, this is shoulder motion, which means that there's going to be a centripetal force involved. Centripetal force in this case is going to be this static frictional force. And this static frictional force is maximized. That's, that, that's the speed at which this thing is going to go into skid. The vehicle is going to go into skid. So we're looking at the net radial force. The net radial force is responsible for the centripetal force that we're looking at. The centripetal force is going to be caused by this static frictional force. So the centripetal force formula is this one, mv squared divided by r. When the static friction, of course, is maximized, it's going to go into skids. It's going to become maximized at the maximum speed with which this vehicle is going to be able to negotiate the curve. So solve for the maximum speed. All right, so my method, uh, method of solving a problem is just isolate the unknown first. So our unknown is going to be the maximum speed, so it's going to be on the left-hand side. 
On the right hand side, you would know the mass of the vehicle, you would know the radius of the curvature, the static frictional force requires that you have to use the static frictional force formula, which would be set as times 10. And there's a reaction force. All right, so it's a surface force, it's gonna be a reaction force. In this case, it's gonna be a reaction force to the weight, some of the forces on the y direction. There's no acceleration on the y direction, so this term becomes zero. So, which means that the normal force is the same as weight, weight is mg, so n becomes the apparent weight. Your back substitution here, so this is gonna give us the formula for the static frictional force. All right, so we do one more back substitution. In order to get the maximum speed at which the vehicle is gonna go into a skid on a curve. So the mass of the vehicle is not gonna matter. So the maximum speed at which everything is gonna go into a skid does not depend on the mass of the vehicle. The only thing it depends on is the quality of tires, which is gonna be mu sub s, the traction number. It's also gonna depend on the radius of curvature. So for identical or nearly identical quality of tires, the only thing that matters is the radius of curvature of the road. All right, so the mass of the vehicle does not matter. Okay, so what that means is if I can negotiate a curve without going to the skid at 60 miles per hour, SUV should be able to do the same. The bus should be able to do the same. The bus drivers tend to be a lot more cautious for the obvious reason, because they have a high center of gravity. All right, so the high center of gravity means that they are gonna be prone to rollovers. All right, so the question is, are these buses designed in such a way that they should go into a skid first and maybe roll over, or would they roll over first and then skid off the road? Okay, so that's what the question is. I'm more interested in what is the maximum speed at which they will actually pull over? Okay, is it 35 miles per hour? Is it 45 miles per hour? Are these people being way too fast? I'm beautiful Dubai. Okay, so the one thing that I want to remember is at the rollover speed, as you reach the rollover speed. You can't! 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 You outer perimeter of the circle that you're looking at. So the entire weight is gonna be shifted onto the outer perimeter tires that we're looking at. Okay, so that becomes the condition for rollover. So right at the rollover speed, this is what happens. If you exceed the rollover speed, the vehicle is gonna roll over. What's up guys? So that's what we're gonna be investigating. So what is the maximum speed for a rollover? So that's what we are focusing on. Uh, so here's the vehicle. You got the four tires you're looking at, two dimensional. This is gonna be the center of mass. See, I mean center of mass. Uh, height is going to be measured with respect to the center of mass, so it's going to be measured with respect to the distance between the center of mass and the ground, in essence. He's going to represent the separation distance between tires. All right, separation distance is going to be measured with respect to the center of mass of these tires. Okay, so not edges, the center of mass. So H is the height of the center of mass, D is the separation distance between the tires. All right, so if this is circular motion in this direction, if this vehicle is going to go in a circle, so what's going to happen is at the maximum rollover speed, the entire weight is going to be resting on second set of tires in the outer perimeter. So at the speed of the rollover, the entire weight of the vehicle will be on the second tire, which is right here, second set of tires. Okay, so let's set up the mathematics for it. So what is the maximum speed that this is gonna go into a rollover? All right, so this is circular motion. I will cheat. I will use the mathematics that we came up with. So the central force is the static frictional force in this case. I'm not gonna be maximizing the static frictional force, so we're not dealing with the maximum speed at which this is going to go into a skid. I'm just focusing on the static frictional force in general. So just figure out the speed, isolate the speed from here, just like we did before. And then I'm going to come up with an expression for the static frictional force. All right, so let's figure out the static frictional force from this one. Okay, so this one is going to be skewed. It's not the maximum static frictional force I'm interested in. I'm interested in the static frictional force. All right, so I'm going to take a look at the net fork this vehicle relative to the outer tire. So there's a normal force acting on this tire in this direction. And this is the lever arm. Okay, so this is the distance measured relative to the point of rotation. So notice that you look at the distance relative to the force. Okay, so you express this distance in terms of a 90 degree distance. So there's the center of mass. So the center of mass, distance to the center of mass, which is 90 degrees to the normal force is gonna be the separation distance between the tires divided by two. So this is gonna be one torque, one of the torques acting on the system relative to the center of mass. All right, so this distance times N. All right, so there's a second force acting on the tire. So this is the static frictional force acting on it. And then now we will look at the distance to the center of mass, which is gonna be 90 degrees to the static frictional force. Center of mass is located here. So this distance that you're looking at with respect to the um, point of application of the force is gonna be H. 
So four times this height is going to be the second torque. And so this torque is going to be responsible for the counterclockwise clockwise rotation. So clockwise rotation is going to be a negative torque. Uh, once again, guys, it's the distance times the force, distance times the force is going to give you the torque. So the net torque acting on the system is this is going to cause a clockwise rotation. So this is going to be a counterclockwise rotation. This is going to be a positive torque. This one is going to be a clockwise rotation. So this is going to be negative torque. So the net torque acting on the system has to be zero. So immediately, this is going to give us an expression for the frictional force. So isolate the frictional force from here. And this frictional force is the static frictional force. All right, so we came up with an expression for the static frictional force. Just plug it into that formula. All right, so we do a back substitution. We get an expression for the static frictional force. So the normal force, the distance between the tires, and then two times the distance to the center of mass. And then what else? So everything is multiplied by R divided by M. Okay, so let's stop at this point. Okay, so mass of the vehicle, bullet matter. Okay, so what else? It is a reaction force. This may be related to weight. All right, more than likely the mass is not gonna matter. So what we need to do is come up with an expression for N. N is a reaction force to weight. So set up the forces. Net force on the y direction is gonna be N is in the up direction, W is in the down direction. There's no acceleration on the y direction. So which means that N is the same as W, W is the same as MG. So we do a back substitution here. Okay, so the mass of the vehicle is not gonna matter. So bus, for example, MW, SUV makes no difference. All right, so the masses will cancel out. As it so happens, a um, couple of things that matter. So speed at which it's gonna go into the skid, speed at which it's gonna roll over, depends on the radius of curvature. All right, so here the radius of curvature of the turn is, the larger the speed becomes at which it's gonna roll over. Okay, so aside from that, the other factor is the larger the separation distance between the tires, the wider the vehicle is, the larger the speed at which it's gonna go into, it's gonna, it's gonna roll over. Okay, one that most people focus on as higher up the center of mass is, the smaller the speed at which it's gonna roll over. Right, so this is, if the center of mass is higher up, obviously they're gonna be more prone to rollovers. The buses have a higher center of mass, therefore they are gonna be more susceptible to rollovers. Okay, the question is, realistically though, I mean, 45 miles per hour, could they not go at 45? How about 55? How about 60? Okay, so how do you know what the rollover speed of a vehicle is, the car, the buses? Are they being over abundantly cautious? Right, so that's okay. So this is the formula that we came up with. The maximum speed for a rollover is going to depend on the radius of curvature of the road, and it's going to depend on the separation distance between the tires. The wider the vehicle is, the larger that speed is. Higher up the center of mass is, the more prone they become to rollovers. All right. So the next question is the next one is a mind twister. All right. So will a bus? What happens to the bus? Will they skid off the ramp first for rolling over, or will they roll over first and then skid off the road? All right. So. This one is of a mind twister. All right, so this is the maximum speed at which the vehicle is gonna roll over. This is the maximum rollover speed. And this one is the maximum speed at which the vehicle is gonna go into skid on a, on a curve. All right, so skid off a ramp. Okay, so it's the maximum rollover speed. This is the rollover speed. It says maximum speed at which the vehicle is gonna skid, skid off the road. Okay, so we'll do a comparison. Um, Let's take a look at the ratio of the rollover speed to the maximum speed at which it's gonna skid off the road. Okay. All right, so this is the rollover speed. Everything in black is gonna be related to rollover speed, and everything in green is gonna be related to maximum speed at which it's gonna skid off the road. Okay, let's check to see if we have any cancellations. All right, G and R will cancel. Then we came up with an expression. Me sub S are you need to maximize the static frictional force. Static frictional force is gonna maximize that. When mu sub s, the coefficient of static friction is 1.2, so this term is gonna become 1.2. So I'll do a substitution there. So that becomes 2.4. And then I'm gonna express the rollover speed in terms of the maximum speed this thing is gonna skid off the road. And so I came up with a, oh, all right, this thing was edited and then evidently, uh, okay, didn't like doing it that way. Mm. Okay, and edit it again. All right, so I'm just gonna, just to get a better idea of what is what. Okay, so I'm setting up my conditions one more time. 
D is going to represent the separation distance between the tires. So I'm looking at the separation distance expressed in terms of the uh, location of the center of mass, height with respect to the center of mass. And let's pretend that rollover speed is more or less the same as the speed of maximum speed at which this vehicle is going to go into the skid. Okay, so and then I'm going to express separation distance between the tires in terms of the distance to the center of mass. Okay. And then I end up getting this expression. So which means that if the separation distance between the tires is almost two and a half times the distance to the center of mass, then this vehicle is going to be stable. What that means is the maximum speed at the vehicle is going to go into the skid is also going to be the same as the rollover speed. All right. So which means that if you don't want this vehicle to roll over, what you need to do is you need to increase the separation distance between the tires and make it roughly about two and a half times the distance to the center of mass of the vehicle, which means that you have to somehow bring the center of mass lower to the ground. Okay. All right, so that's the meaning of it. So which means that either they have to bring the center of mass lower to the ground, all right, so you can do it by engineering or you can just make the tires wider, the distance between the tires wider, okay. The only thing that I can tell you out of this exercise is um, the speed at which they usually roll over is fairly high. It's very close to the skidding. It's very close to the speed at which the vehicles are about to skid off the road, all right. I, usually off ramps and on ramps are designed around 65 miles per hour and then they bank it so you can negotiate around 70 miles per hour. The buses can get up to about 60 miles per hour before they roll over in essence. All right, so that's what it is. So they're being overly cautious. All right, so let's finish this up. Okay, so what's the force? Uh, force is what causes acceleration. So force acting on the mass is gonna cause it to accelerate. Torque is a rotational force. Uh, Right, so torque acting on the rotational inertia is going to cause it to rotationally accelerate. Okay, so write down the torque formula for this expression. So get a force coming in at an angle. All right, so component of the force, which is going to be responsible for torque, is going to be the perpendicular component of the force. It's going to be perpendicular to the point of rotation, the rotational axis. So it's going to be sine of the angle of the force that you're looking at. So the force times the distance to the point of rotation. Component of, angle, component of the force, which is perpendicular, perpendicular component of the force to the point of rotation, distance to the point of rotation is gonna be our torque. The component, the, oh, shit. The uh, perpendicular component of the force is gonna be sign of the angle of the force times rotational distance to the point of rotation that we're looking at. So that's the generic formula. Okay, I'm gonna skip from five. Torque is gonna be positive if the rotation is in the counterclockwise direction. It's gonna be negative when the rotation is in the clockwise direction. Work is force causing displacement. Rotational work is torque causing rotational displacement. Momentum is mass giving at a given velocity. It's a combination of mass and its velocity. The angular momentum is the momentum with respect to the point of rotation. All right, angular momentum is gonna be conserved. The net force acting conserves momentum, the net force acting in a system. What kind of angular momentum, the net torque acting on a system being zero. The absence of a net force acting on a system is going to conserve momentum. And absence of a net torque acting on a system is going to conserve momentum. So what happens to the angular velocity if the moment of inertia is suddenly reduced? If you reduce the moment of inertia, the angular velocity is going to go up because the angular momentum is constant. What happens to the angular momentum if the moment of inertia is suddenly reduced? If you reduce, what happens to the angular velocity? Suddenly, okay, so what happens to the angular momentum if the moment of inertia is suddenly reduced? Okay, all right, guys, there's a typo, it's suddenly increased. So if you increase the moment of inertia, angular velocity is going to go down. What happens to the rotation kinetic energy when the moment of inertia is suddenly reduced? If you reduce the moment of inertia, angular velocity is going to go up, the kinetic energy is going to go up. All right, so where does the actual kinetic energy come from when the moment of inertia is suddenly reduced? The actual kinetic energy is going to come from your muscles or it's going to come from an internal force. If you're using your muscles, obviously chemical energy gets converted into heat, then it gets converted into mechanical energy. The mechanical energy is going to appear in the form of increased rotational, rotational kinetic energy of the system. Okay, so what, what are the conditions for equilibrium? Condition number one, the net force is going to be zero. Condition number two, net torque is going to be zero. 